Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Jim Flyzik. During today's show, we will discuss mobility strategies in the federal government. With me today on the show are Jake Marcellus, the Acting Portfolio Manager, Department of Defense Mobility, Jeff Hill, Deputy Division Chief of Mobility and Remote Access Division, Department of State, Frank Koneshny, the Chief Technology Officer at the U.S. Air Force, Brian Kopstick, the Director of Mobile Innovation, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, U.S. Public Sector, and Chris O'Connell, the Vice President of the Public Sector at Opping Corporation. Let's talk uh, mobility, guys. Um, let's first talk about progress we see uh, being made. Jake, let's start with you over at DOD DISA. How, uh, tell us a little bit about some of the progress you're making in your mobility program. Well, thanks, Jim, first for having us here. Sure. So at DISA, uh, our Director of Strategic Guidance has been enabling responsive, decisive actions for uh, DOD leaders uh, for with any device, anytime, anywhere. And to support that, DISA has successfully implemented a full uh, service offering for mobility on the class and unclass side. Uh, on the unclass side, we have tens of thousands of users uh, using a full suite of uh, enterprise mobility management, mm -hmm. content management, access to email, uh, public switch telephone uh, access. Uh, as, as well as um, uh, apps, right? Right. We have over right. 300 apps on, and, and vetted apps in our store, approved apps in our store. On the class side, uh, we have about 1,400 uh, users using our secure mobile classified, uh, which gives us uh, secure telephony uh -huh. and uh, email services and some rich content. Right. Uh, Right. Do you see desktops sort of like uh, slowly fading away in the future? Or uh, they're still uh, we do, right? So that's yeah. that's that's our intent, right? They're the they're the competition, yeah, I right? I figured I had to have get that question <laughs> in somewhere because you know, as uh, you hear a lot of a lot of people talking about, you know, the the, the era of the desktop could be, could be coming to an, to, a, to an end soon. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Jeff Hill, Department of State. Tell us a little bit about some of the progress the state's making in mobility programs. At the Department of State, we've been making a lot of progress on uh, expanding our uh, mobile and remote access programs. Okay. Um, our uh, IT top three priorities are uh, mobile, cybersecurity, and a group of cloud-based services we call the Foreign Affairs Network. Now, as for mobile, our goal is to empower our workforce to better be able to serve the American public Anywhere they are. So right. like Jake said, you know, anytime, any place, you know, anywhere, right. bringing services to the American citizens. And um, one of the uh, things I've been able to experience firsthand, uh, a few years ago I was overseas in, uh, in Egypt during the political mm -hmm. disturbances. And using our mobile devices, we were able to <coughs> detect and report uh, disturbances on the street and uh, you know sure. all kind of insecure uh, right. situations and we were able to share that information with the community thanks to our mobile devices and having GPS for example on our mobile devices if you had to take a detour right. to get around a roadblock or you know some or some, some dangerous thing yes then you then you could get back on track right. and you knew where you were so yeah, it, this is really making us more effective overseas. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I don't know when I work. I have no idea what, when I work anymore. I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I guess I work whenever someone sends me an email, I respond to it, now, but, you know, unless I'm sleeping. Um, <clears throat> Frank, uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your um, mobility programs and progress you see being made at the Air Force? Well, we have lots of mobility programs. In fact, we've set up a governance body now our enterprise services mobility panel basically to, to control and to organize across the Air Force exactly what we want to do as an enterprise level. Mm -hmm. And this is various lines of effort, meaning the infrastructure, the, the, the MDM, the devices, the applications, standardizing applications and such. That's because we have lots of mobility already established and we're trying to con not contain it, but control it better. For instance, we have logistics applications, we do a lot of maintenance with uh, mobility, we do training as well as a mobile environment. We have, as probably you know, electronic flight books all over the place. There's tens of thousands of those that we actually utilize for the pilots. And we have, you know, uh, the executive comms that Jake talked about already. Right. And on top of that, we've now added emergency notification systems. Wow. So we have lots of programs that we're currently doing mobility right now. We're trying to organize in such a way that we can extend it to the entire enterprise and be consistent across the board. Cool. Very cool. Uh, Brian Koopstick. 
Uh, tell us how Hewlett Packard's position in this and the kinds of progress you're making supporting uh, your government customers in mobility programs. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what we're really seeing is we're starting to see beyond what I will say, just little incremental uh -huh. successes, and we're moving more towards how we're going to fundamentally change the process, right? And how we're going to use the devices, MDM, things like that were interesting, mm -hmm. but how we're going to fundamentally do a jump shift into enabling a greater level of productivity. I think the other thing we're seeing is a greater influence of 18F, the U.S. Digital Services, into some of the procurements and acquisition, right. which fundamentally are making a huge difference. People are willing to experiment, they're willing to fail, see where it excels, and then take those and ramp those and scale it, as opposed to being assuming perfection from the get-go. Yeah, right. Yeah, once um, when I was uh, the Vice Chair of the Federal CI Council, I um, suggested having an award for someone who tries something really innovative and creative that didn't work. Just for the fact that they tried to do it. Yeah, it went nowhere. I didn't, I didn't even come close to getting that thing, getting anyone to pay attention to me, but I tried. Yeah, we're <laughs> the fear of failure, and we're now right. willing to try. Yeah. And I think that's what's really going to lead to the real innovation that's going to be needed. Well, we don't want to just have, you know, low price, technically acceptable kinds of things and take the, uh, the least risky way out every single, you know, and go with it. Yeah, we need, Pete, we need some innovation in this, in this area. Chris O'Connell uh, over at Appian, tell us uh, how you're positioning and the kinds of things you're doing in uh, the, the world of mobility to help support your customer base. Yeah, it's an exciting time for federal mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, App Incorporation is a software company. We deliver a no-code application platform. Okay. And what's central to that is that every application is mobile. And so we're really focused on helping government tackle its most challenging problems and provide mission solutions that are simple, that engage with both constituents externally and internally to the organization and that allows us to bring forward business process management solutions and case management solutions that address what the government's trying to do today. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like that simple part too, you know, and um, I keep thinking of the next generation of workforce coming up and what, what their, their expectations are going to be. Um, I mean, I've got a six-year-old grandson that down, can download apps left and right, you know, sometimes when I can't figure something out, how to do something, I'll ask him to help me. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about a specific program. You know, we talked about progress in general, but our listening audience always likes to hear about, uh, you know, a couple of specific <coughs> programs that are actually making a difference or doing things um, to, uh, to move the ball forward in this area. So let's start, let's start with Jeff Phil this time. Jeff, what, uh, what would you cite as a, a specific successful program you think at state that's making a difference? Yeah, um, Chris mentioned app development. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a program that, uh, that we uh, made some great progress on in the Department of State recently. Um, in the past, um, mo we found that mobile app development is, is quite difficult. Um, I mean, the, the development itself is not so difficult, but the developers often don't realize all the legal privacy, accessibility, yeah. and other requirements that they'll run into. Right. And so what we did, and we were inspired by the Veterans Administration Mobile Health Program website, which lays out their process. Okay. And we also worked with our uh, DHS colleagues who are doing the same thing. And we came up with a comprehensive custom mobile app development process that guides developers you know, through the whole process of all the, the, the pitfalls and, and uh, techniques that they should use to develop a mobile app at the Department of State. Hmm. And one thing that we did uh, that was especially helpful is closely partner with our security colleagues. So we have baked the security in yeah. to the process Good move. Good move. and that helps them expedite the approval process. Mm -hmm. So now we have, we're developing a code repository that the developers can use. So with this uh, integration engine they can have the, the static code analyzed and get the reports, and by the time it gets to the final approval process, they're most of the way there. So right. instead of throwing the code over the wall to the security folks and then saying, oops, no, you right. can't do that. Now, right. I think we've reduced the risk of failure for apps and, yeah, and kind of like, enabled um, that. It's sounds similar to an agile, an agile development yes, process it is. there. The, um, Frank <coughs> Konechny, what, uh, if I asked you to point out a specific program, what would you point out at the Air Force? 
you know, everybody points out electronic flight books, but I think we're going to go with logistics this time. Logistics? <laughs> yes, logistics. <clears throat> mainly because of the way that we're using mobility. We're using mobility on the flight line for actually doing the maintenance efforts and using the manuals at the same time. We're using it to research various parts, the location of parts and the availability of parts. We're using it to communicate actually between the various maintenance personnel mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the station as well as back to the flight line. And so I think it's, you know, we're trying to actually, I guess you would say, uh, make our mobile environment and logistics area all over the, to make more effective across uh -huh. the board for everybody. And, and we're doing this in such a way that even we're looking at a new device now, which is innovative, which is risky as can be, that we're actually going to use to uh, scan all the barcodes and every other strange so barcodes. Like barcodes on the devices? On yes, the parts? and parts. I mean, we have various barcodes, old barcodes, new barcodes. We have barcodes that are left over from the 40s, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's new apps coming out every day, too, to let you find things. You That's know? right. So we're trying to do is have a, a single device with uh, commercially available with plug-ons or add-ons that will actually use, use in both a classified and unclassified environment to scan all the barcodes. This is innovative. It's risky as can be. Security is involved. <laughs> but yeah, but I bet in the long run, um, because you know, if you believe what you read now, a lot of times, like at variety of government agencies, you, you don't know how many what you have today. And finding things is like you know a nightmare. Right, and it's all so, manual right now. Yeah. The uh, Jake Marcellus, yeah. what do you think uh, if I said um, here is a program that I think is really cool and is doing yeah. some neat stuff? So I, I'd have to highlight our. Um, our classified mobility program, right? So um, I, I don't think it's, it, it may not be doing anything innovative, right? It's just the fact that it exists. Uh, well, the fact that you've got the you know, authority to operate and things like that, that for a classified uh, program. Uh, yes, um, yes, you know. yes, and we have the largest classified program. Um, ma many other organizations are coming to us to include non-DOD uh, federal partners because they see that, you know, developing a program like this is, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is, is not a, you know, it's non-trivial, uh, uh, endeavor, right? right. Um, so, if, if um, as well as using the classified um, commercial solutions for classified right. um, standards in order to you know get off the shelf components and right. put it together. So, what, what does that give us? It uh, really gives us flexibility to have low cost and you know really fast time to market solutions. Um, and, and the reason I say it's a great success is because of the demand. That right. is asked for. Um, now, is it mostly data or is it voice and data? It is voice and and a limited amount of data. Okay. Yes. And let me ask you a question then: For a classified voice conversation, where does some speak from? You know, no, I mean, right. you can't walk right. down the street with people around you having a right. So, <laughs> so, so, so you just hit on one of one of one of the biggest issues, right? So, our biggest issues are not you know technical on how we get it to work, but it's really about policy, right? Yeah. And and the policy make sure people. Right know that you can't right, be walking down right. the street and next to Joe Citizen and, and have right. a conversation that's classified. And, and for it to be mobile, you know, a, a mobile, right, mobile use of this, right, right? It's, a, it's a big paradigm shift, right? But in the past, you went into a room, you, uh, you turned the dial, opened it up, and closed right. some probably that's large right. door and made your telephone call where, you know, we're, we're seeing now that, you know, that's an anti-pattern to, to yeah. mobility. Yeah. So. Interesting, very interesting subject. Interesting watching that. Develop. Um, Chris O'Connell, um, if I said, uh, asked you to point out a specific program that you think is making a big difference in the, the world of mobility, what would you point at? Yeah, what's exciting is there's, it's hard to say just one. Okay. Um, well, you know, Appian's mm -hmm. thrilled that, you know, a couple years ago we were added to the DISA Mobility Store, and okay. that was because of an acquisition application, uh, DISA's Ideas, which is their contract writing system. Um, but we're also excited because we're seeing a lot of work, especially in the field, for investigations, for site surveys, because the government has a lot of case management and processes. Part of those processes means getting out and mm -hmm. to the different places that we serve, whether it be the flight line and logistics and safety at an Air Force Logistics Center or out for USDA or DHS for critical infrastructure protection. So we've seen some programs that have increased the throughput by 1,500% the number of security audits that they've done on critical infrastructure. We've seen uh, hazards being reported and addressed 
within minutes instead of weeks. Uh, so it's very exciting to see that the edge has moved out yeah. and it's allowing the government worker to have access to the data that they need in order to do their job wherever they are. Yeah, and I think the trend, you know, I mean, obviously the trend is just going to continue indefinitely now. I mean, I think the workforce 10 years from now is going to be vastly different than it is today because of mobility and the be better broadband uh, speeds getting up getting out there and better coverage areas. Uh, it's just not going to make a whole lot of sense anymore to, to have that hour commute in, hour commute out when uh, the the job's going to be virtual. Um, Brian Cookstick, let's uh, point out a specific program that you think is pretty cool, doing some neat stuff. Um, you know, I would echo Chris's comments um, because there are a lot out there. We actually stood up a digital services team within the organization, um, you know, between late last year and early year, and I can safely say, you know, even with five five day turnaround on prototypes. Um, there's a backlog. Um, we're getting so many different requests coming in. And, you know, one of the examples that I thought was really neat was what we did around probation officers. Um, San Diego actually launched a program and basically to enable the caseload to be more efficient. Field services is one of the most common use mm -hmm. cases. And by putting it on a mobile device, using voice as input as opposed to, you know, keyboards, things like that, you know, they're seeing between a 55 and 85 percent increase in the amount of time in the field. So it's a great example of mobility being the power of wild, the ability to deliver the good or service more effectively while still reducing the costs. And I, I think that's a fabulous example of making it a taking a process and making it more effective in the field. So by the probation officers managing their caseloads remotely, is that? Absolutely, absolutely. And as I said, they spend more time in the field and they're able to touch these people um, much more rapidly, much more efficiently. Uh, and it's, you know, you're seeing it evolve because you'll get initially fielded and then it'll evolve over time. It would be nice if it did this. This little feature would make me incrementally more productive. And it's those incrementals that really start to drive the paradigm forward. Yeah, actually, I, I like that. I think, you know, you're, you're touching on the fact that if you give people some basic building blocks, they'll come up with some of their own innovative ideas and, and the thing just, you know, grows. And yeah. The feedback loop, I think, is key because now it's a direct line of feedback between the user and the developer and the mission. And this would make me more productive. And the ability to do those quick turn incrementals, right. okay, you're more responsive to your users, the users are more satisfied, it's a win-win all the way around. Right. Yeah, it's probably hard to imagine anymore like an application being built that won't have some type of a mobility aspect to it. You know, I mean, it's sort of like just about everything you, you think to do anymore is going to have some aspect of it that, that'll involve a mobility program. Um, <clears throat> we talked about progress. We talked about some specific programs. We need to chat about some of the lessons we're learning and some of the challenges we're facing. But first, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Jake Marcellus from uh, Department of Defense Mobility, Jeff Hill from Department of State, Frank Konechny from U.S. Air Force, Brian Kopstick from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, U.S. Public Sector, and Chris O'Connell from Appian. We're talking mobility. When we went to break, we were talking about specific programs. What are we learning as we uh, work our way through these programs? Let's start this time with Frank, Frank Konechny. Frank, what are some of the lessons learned that you would, uh, you know, you're talking to the audience on the radio now, your, your colleagues in government and industry as they're working these programs, what are some of the things you'd pass on to them that you think uh, they should know? There's a couple of them. Uh, first of all, involve the user. Brian already mentioned this, but it's very important because they're the ones that are actually going to come out with what they need. And we found that a lot with the logistics environment, that we had to ask them what they wanted as opposed to giving them something and basically waiting for them to complain about it didn't do what they wanted it to do. That's the first thing. Next thing is to uh, have some governance. Uh, otherwise, you have well, well, west, especially for our organization, which is really large, and everybody wants to do their own thing. They want to be innovative, however, you want to control that innovation to give a positive ed end point of it. Also, uh, the last one is really make sure you have the right infrastructure to support this. 
you know, we say I, we want logistics of the flight line and whatever, but Wi-Fi doesn't cut it in many cases because it doesn't go far enough. So we're looking at LTE as to supporting it, and therefore you have to have the environment to actually do the job you want to do, especially when we start moving content. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we want to do things more dynamically. In fact, we've looked at you know using hollow lenses and things on the eyes of the maintenance personnel to actually go through videos so they can actually see what they have to do. So okay. we're getting to the point now where we're trying to advance it, but the infrastructure does not support it. It's going to be very difficult to get there. Yeah. Excellent point, excellent point. I like that one too about involving the user. What a novel idea. If we're going to build something for someone, we should maybe we should ask them what they want. <laughs> the, uh, I, I remember the days, though, the early days of the, the IT shop, you know, where we, they developed something, hand it to people, and they hand it back and back and forth, and uh, things have really changed uh, since then, which is a good thing. Uh, Jake Marcellus, what, uh, what kind of lessons learned uh, along the way here as you work your way through all these yeah, mobility so I, programs? I, I want to piggyback off of those statements. So customers are going to really measure the success of your program based on their experience of mm -hmm. mobile devices right that they own and use today operate today so as you, as you said in the past maybe there was not a parallel that you can draw but today everyone right, right. children have mobility devices and, and use them so again I, I'd say uh, as well as uh, working with the users, right? You, 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 we really should employ soft-skilled people on our product teams, right? Mm -hmm. You know, technologists will really take us to how do we do things, right. but today you'll find a mobility expert or someone who uses a user interface, right, in, 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 in pretty much any industry. Um, mobility devices inherently use non-assured transport um, to, to uh, do, you know, perform information exchanges, right. right? So as you're developing apps, right, you really should understand what are the minimums um, and, and, and what are the maximums that are required for, for you to have a, a quality service, as well as service, uh, service coverage. So uh, many of our, our, our customers will say, hey, our device doesn't work here. And as we look at a, a coverage map, we say, because there's no coverage here. Yeah. And a customer um, will express their ire back at the program because the expectation is, I deliver this service, I deliver this device, right? And I should explain mm -hmm. you know, when and how it works. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You said something earlier too, Jim, that uh, you, we work uh, any hour, right? Uh, not only anywhere, but any hour of the day. So uh, establish self-service uh, support capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, users today in their personal lives expect that they can get some help at 2 a.m. in the morning if they right. need it, right? And, and, and senior uh, uh, leaders uh, sh should have that same experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's... Uh as I said when we started, I have no idea when I work. I mean, uh, if someone asked me what are your work hours, I'd say I have, I have, I'm clueless. I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> Jeff Hill, what do you think uh, are some of the lessons you're learning along the way here? Well, one of the lessons that we've learned is that with mobility, centralizing the back-end support infrastructure and the support system mm -hmm. works very well. So. Um, with the increases in the better technology of the MDM systems, we've been able to uh, uh, have a drastic reduction in the number of uh, servers that we have supporting our mobile devices. So we're at hundreds of locations around the world yes. in the Department of State. And by centralizing the, the back end, um, we've been able to reduce hundreds of servers on the network and reduce support costs and increase security. And uh, I tack on to what, what Jake said about 24-7 uh, you know, support that the right. users expect. Um, we've also uh, enhanced and stood up a specialized branch of our IT support desk. So uh, now a user can call the mobile and remote access uh, support hotline 24-7. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, about 90% of the support calls are resolved on the wow. first call. That's one advantage having people all around the world. you got all the time zones covered, right. so somebody's awake all, at some point during the 24-hour cycle. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. So there's 65,000 users that, uh, that can call us, and uh, it made a lot of sense to centralize it because of the complexity of these devices. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a different right. skill set, right. and, and not everybody knows how to you know, handle the radio, the telephony, the data. Um, so by having a, a specialized uh, right. service desk, it's right. 
been a good I'm not lesson. I'm going to go to the you know, Android versus iPhones versus L LMR versus LTE or anywhere. I'm a, uh, that, that's probably a whole other set of discussions that we could have for a long time. Uh, Chris O'Connell, what do you think um, are some of the lessons you're learning as uh, you work your way through mobility programs supporting your government customers? Yeah, it's been an interesting transition. Uh, I think one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Jim, was that every application at some point is be going to become mobile. And what I would propose is that the government needs to think about mobility now and for every application. Otherwise, very quickly, if there isn't that mobile component and delivery mechanism, it, you're delivering a legacy application right. day one. Right. Um, so think about that now. Leverage agile, tech, agile delivery methodologies right. to really enhance the customer experience and, and make sure they're getting what they need. I think th there are lessons to be learned in mobile app design, okay. that there is a simplicity and a user focus mm -hmm. that needs to be transitioned to all of our applications across the federal government, where it guides users in, that it allows them to interact intuitively. Mm -hmm. So taking the best practices and benefits of UI design right. from a mobile perspective and really applying that to everything that we do uh, tends to bring applications that customers want to use, that our citizens want to use, that our government employees want to use. Right. The thing you said there that really makes sense to me is thinking of the mob mobile application at the same time you're building whatever the traditional application is. What you don't want to do is have a traditional application and then it looks kludgy when you try to run it on a mobile device or, you know, it's, it's all over the place and you can't figure out where, you know, how, it, it just works different. There's companies out there today, I think, that are making a living just doing that, making applications look the same on a mobile device that they look on a uh, desktop. Yeah, and I, I'd add to that. Uh, mm. That's something that we do as a platform that you want to write it once and allow it to be used by any device that's out there. Right. Uh, and that's something that we do even when our agencies that we're serving don't have their policies or security in place yet right. in order to allow it out. Right. Well, when they do have that, they can just allow that to work as opposed to going back and building something separate on top. Yep, yep, good point. I know there's, there's a lot of commercial applications out there too that you know you run on, you know, on the desktop and you know and they're working fine and then you you sign on on a, on a uh, you know a Android or iPhone or whatever and, it, and it's all kludgy and you can't figure out where stuff is and things like that. You don't want that. Brian, uh, <clears throat> Copstick, what's um, some of the lessons you're learning along the way here as you're uh, developing your mobility programs to support your government customers? So I, I would echo what Chris said. You know, implementing a level of design thinking into the entire process um, is, is fundamentally key. And but the point I will disagree with is just you don't really mobilize applications, you mobilize transactions, right? And understanding that the form and nature of these applications are fundamentally different. It's not you know, a single application oftentimes, it's multiple applications being encompassed into that transaction. Hmm. I think uh, to uh, State's point is really around building that ecosystem, okay? It's not just about the MDM. It's about how do I enable developers to build content and get it out there to the field? Uh, you know, anywhere from support to instrumentation, so that you can actually manage and measure the quality of your experience end to end. And that's really a very key element to it because you can, you know, user experience is a lot more than, you know, the current design techniques, whether it's flat, gradient breaks, things like that. It's more about, can I get done what I want to get done? Whether it's a mom coming home ordering pizza because she's on the go with her kids. That's a very simple example. How do I make that transaction simpler? And having an experience that resonates on the device that it's on, thinking that it's going to look the same across all three, the screen real estate's different. How do I optimize the transaction? I think the other thing lessons learned is legacy constructs are, you know, policy plus process equals time, and time is the killer of everything in right. mobile. So legacy constructs in and take trying to apply those to a mobile digital world just don't hunt. I mean, think about CMMI and. You know, it does have its place. Mm -hmm. But in reality, okay, 
what was the problem it was designed to solve, okay? It was originally originated in the 70s and 80s when software development projects spanned years right. and trying to keep it integrated. The reality is now we're talking about turning a prototype in a week. That's a very different paradigm and a very different problem you're trying to solve. So getting those legacy constructs out of the way are fundamentally part of the solution to making more things mobile. And the last thing is, is understanding there is a digital divide, whether you talk about demographics, whether you talk cultural, things like that, and thinking that you're going to immediately find a way to bridge it all together from the get-go is a mistake, right? It's an evolution. And experiment, play, try and figure out what is the best way to reach that particular segment and enable them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting comments there. I like that a lot. The, um, let's talk about the hard stuff or the things that are difficult to do, you know, the, the challenges that get in the way when you're trying to, to build these programs. Um, let's start with Jake and uh, talking about DOD DISA. Um, what are some of the challenges you face every day? What are some of the hard things that you got to get accomplished in order to get where you want to go with these programs? Right. So, so our, our uh, mobility program is not just for one uh, enterprise or IT infrastructure, right? We are actually acting as a service provider. Right. Um, so uh, we have to integrate with uh, multiple IT infrastructures and really make our, our devices um, and services useful to, to many. So uh, right now we're working on a mobile content management solution um, for which uh, we'd, we'd like for, for Frank's uh, Air Force and EFB teams to be, become one of our first customers. Uh, and when we're, <laughs> we're, we're I love this radio show. We bring people together to work. <laughs> and I'm and I'm trying to sell my services while, while <laughs> there we're you here. Go, there you go. <laughs> and and some of the challenges there is 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 how do you how do you make a, a solution like that connect? And it's about content, right? We want we want the user to be able to work on a, a productivity application, you know, on their desktop and then move it to a mobile. So today, many you know, in many solutions is to email that document around, right, and, and, and save it back, right? So um, how do I not create a new content management system for which everyone to integrate into, but actually integrate into other IT backend content inf infrastructure? Um, and the other challenges we have is in the service ordering process, right? And again, it stems from us being a service provider. Um, each, each enterprise will have unique configurations that they want or, or, or unique uh, applications in their store, right? So as, as we provision approximately 150 devices uh, a week, right, our teams are, are, are looking at how do we have uh, maybe 2,700 different configurations um, combinations, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we automate that? Right. So what we're looking at is that as we as we want to integrate into uh, the DISA service order capture, right, how do we build in middleware mobility order management systems so that we can, we can actually deliver uh, at the speed of computers, right, not humans looking at spreadsheets. Right, right. Yeah, we've had that discussion on a number of radio shows. Uh, the world we live in today is um, people expect decision making, you know, in real time. I mean, that's the world we're moving to is uh, real time decision making. Uh, Jeff, what do you think are some of the, the tough things, the challenges you face every day that you need to work your way through in order to get where you want to get with your mobility programs? Yeah, there, there are several. And uh, one is uh, something uh, Brian alluded to. Um, users want different types of devices. You know, yeah. Different people bring their, their favorite device or you know, the, they ask for oh, us to uh, issue the favorite, their favorite type of device. I think that, that issue's been going on for a long time. Right. Could go all the way back to the word perfect versus word days, you know? I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> so someone knows how to use Apple and they want to use that or right. Android or, right. or whatever. So that makes app development harder. Mm -hmm. um, it's not impossible, but, it, it, but it's more challenging because right. the devices have have different capabilities, so that's well, that's one challenge. Um, another challenge is in uh, agencies that are more concerned about security. We need, we want greater control over the devices. So we would like the the MDM, the mobile device management system, to be able to restrict features. You know, right. to keep the user from turning on Bluetooth in certain areas, or to prevent 
OS upgrades or app upgrades right. or to keep a foreign uh, cellular service provider from pushing apps to the device. Right. So we need greater control over our devices. They are great. They're great points there. Yeah, and uh, there's some there's some others like uh, drive credentials. I think we're all grappling with with that. Um, you know, we want to get rid of network passwords on yeah. our system and. Uh, that's Everyone is challenge. talking derived credentials. It's a hot, hot topic yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I think companies that first get really good solutions there are going to be positioned very well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, yeah I've actually saw some demos of some phones that have like, um, it's in this sort of like bring your own device day, you know, where they, um, when you turn on a business application, it shuts down all the serendipity kinds of things that are on your phone. And when you turn on one of the, you know, your personal serendipity things, it shuts off all the business apps and so forth and things like yeah. that. So I think those technologies are, are coming. I think they're industry proving, knows they're, 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 they're that has to happen, and, yeah. you know, and, and, and you're right to, to prevent uh, people from putting foreign apps on, on machines and things like yeah. that. Frank, what's the tough stuff? The, um, I think the toughest right now is well, there's a couple of tough things, but the toughest is probably trying to manage all the devices across a worldwide environment because the Air Force is worldwide. Yeah. And, and we have, when you talked about LMRs, we have LMRs that want to talk to, to smartphones and send information and content back and forth. We want to have global access across multiple bases with the phones and the LMRs and everything else as well as any device. So the question is, how do you manage all this in a worldwide environment and keep it straight? It is baffling. You know, I have four kids on my family plan, and I can't manage them. They are, they, they're, they, they fight over who gets the next upgrade, and you got the last upgrade, I get the next upgrade, on and on and on. So uh, I'm talking about four. Yeah, You're talking well, about worldwide. Right. And then it's going to get worse. It is worse now because of the IoT, because we're doing flight or Internet, you know, of things. Internet of Things. We're doing management of device of trucks and things as well. We're doing other devices, IoT on the networks now. And so we have to be able to have the MDM actually register some of these IoT devices in a secure way that we actually believe that they're, they're our devices. Right. Because there's a threat vector of something coming in that is not our device and telling us something that is wrong. Right. And so we're trying to manage, talk about managing that. And at the same time, uh, you know, governing across, you know, we, we, we looked about, you know, having uh, multiple devices come in that the users wanted. And we're trying to, to control that and restrict that because right. of the same reasons you said, because you want to be able to cut off various things at the same time yeah. and be careful of what's really happening. And a lot of times you can't do that with every device. Right. So security, of course, is paramount for us. Right. And, and I think Jeff brought up the security thing earlier, and it, it did really dawn on me that, you know, when you download an app, you know, up comes all these, you know, this app would, that has all these following things and need, you know, location information, this and that, and, you know, a whole laundry list of things <laughs> pop up. And I'm thinking in a government environment, that's a whole other set of issues there. Right. But, um, yeah, interesting. Um, I want to hear uh, from our industry guest on uh, the challenges, too, but we need to first take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 a.m. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 a.m. I'm Jim Fleisig here with Jake Marcellus from Department of Defense Mobility, Jeff Hill from Department of State, Frank Konechny from the U.S. Air Force, Brian Kopstick from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, U.S. Public Sector, and Chris O'Connell from Appian Corporation. We're talking mobility. When we went to break, we were talking about challenges. We heard from our government guest here, but I'd like to hear uh, about the challenges from the industry perspective. Let's start with you, Chris O'Connell at Appian. What are some of the big challenges you see in getting mobility programs out there and, and you know, yeah. proliferating. I, I think it's still security and policies mm -hmm. to allow the newer technologies to be deployed and to de be deployed successfully and securely. Uh, I think you can leverage industry. Jeff was mentioning the challenges of multiple devices. Let industry help bring to bear what's been successful commercially to address those. Uh, Appian's platform, you write it and with no additional code, it works on iOS, it works on BlackBerry and native applications, you don't have to do anything else. So there are technologies that have been developed to help address some of these problems, mm -hmm. uh, but recognize that the size and scale of government is there's so much to do. Yeah. And I'd say the other biggest challenge is meeting the demand. I think you are seeing the desire for everyone to use their Absolutely. devices and to be able to leverage technology like they do at home in their work environment. Yeah. And it's just going to continue to get 
bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, as the new generations enter the workforce, they're they're yep. growing up living yep. in a mobile world. They're uh, they're going to have high expectations uh, when they enter the workforce here than the next generation. Uh, Brian Copstick, what do you think are some of the big challenges uh, that we're looking at here? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge fundamentally is the mindset shift, right? Adding software to a broken process doesn't make you digital. The hard part is oftentimes reimagining the process, not writing the software. And I think that's something that people fundamentally miss. Part of what makes some of the mo most popular commercial apps just that is they are reimagining the process, reimagining the entire experience of doing that transaction. And I think that's a fundamental thing that is one of the biggest challenges to get people over. And that's not a technical problem, that's a almost a policy, legal, and uh, just a concept that people, some people are not grasping. I think the speed and adoption of modern development practices and technologies. I mean, you know, we're talking about going from Monday to un understanding the problem to Friday actually having a prototype and, you know, testing it with the users. That's not a policy or uh, a, what I will say application lifecycle construct that is readily available throughout government today. But we're starting to see it, you know, as things move more cloud native and, you know, we're doing multiple deployments on a daily basis basis, you know, even to since, uh, you know, Luke's in the room, DHS, you know, they're doing multiple deployments on a daily basis, right? So the ability to go from development to production enables you to iterate and interact with those users in a new and different way. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very, very well put. You came very close to hitting the culture world, uh, culture word. I stayed away from that one in particular because everybody brings it up. That is the 139th show. This will be the first time we didn't mention culture in a, in a, in a, in a show. That's the truth. But, uh, but you came close. You came I'm close, close, but uh, yeah. Um, what, what we always do, we still have about 14 minutes left in the show. So you each have two minutes, two and a half minutes or so to talk about uh, where this is all going down the road. And let's start with Chris and come right down the table and uh, give me, let, allowing me a few minutes at the end to try to wrap up and summarize what we've done here today. Uh, Chris O'Connell, what do you see down the road? Where's the future? What improvements are we going to see in government in the future that are attributed to, to uh, mobility strategies? And what's uh, government programs going to look like down the road? Well, I think ultimately we stop talking about mobility and applications. Uh, it becomes just central to what we do. We are accessing the processes, the data, and interacting with all of those items in order to get our job done wherever we are and through any device. So having adaptive technologies that are cloud-based that allow agencies to provide better customer service to be able to have an auditable process, transparent data, uh, and being able to more effectively uh, serve their constituents, be it the warfighter in the DOD or citizens uh, across federal civilian, uh, I think the dynamic is changing in that we want that technology gap between our work lives in the government and how people use technology at home in the evenings. That to intersect mm -hmm. and to have that same experience level uh, and adaptability to be able to serve the emerging needs, the new policies, rules, and regulations that are coming down uh, to more rapidly deliver the service that's required. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, you know, just, just making things simpler. And uh, I checked in a hotel yesterday. I set up in advance and I went to the app on my phone and checked in before I got there. When I got there, I walked in. Uh, they had a special line for people pre-checked and that keys are waiting, rooms assigned, everything. Just hand me the keys, I go to the room, done. I mean, zero time in terms of to uh, get through. And I think government's got to think like that too down the road. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, people are, are, are not going to like standing in lines and uh, waiting for things. They're going to want to do things with mobility. Uh, Brian Koopstick, what, what do you think are... Uh, What's it look like down the road? What's your crystal ball look like in terms of where this is all going? Oh, I'll even take your use case and take it one better. Actually, some hotel aid, uh, companies are now actually sending the key to the phone and you bypass the front desk altogether. Cool. Okay, so in my mind, that's even taking it a step further and reimagining it. So 
I think what you're going to see really, and to tack on to Chris's point, was you're going to see a modern enterprise. I mean, we can sum it up in any other way, but it's really just a modern enterprise. And part of that is going to be shared development you know, platforms to be leveraged across government and taking those shared services constructs and taking them to the next level, whether it's shared identity, things like that. Those are going to enable greater reuse and greater leverageability. And I think you're going to see continued implementation of what I will say the 18F US Digital Services playbook and driven through a lot of the procurements. I mean, part of the challenge is how do I acquire it? How do I do this in a way so I don't end up on the front page of the Washington right. Post? I think those are some of the things you're going to see because it's going to become a standard practice. And we're going to see the, what I will say, the risk management framework evolve to risk avoidance to, okay, how do I manage that risk? Okay, what content am I displaying in this particular application versus that one? Because they're not all the same right. as, as a, from a one size fits all. And I think as those things develop, and clearly more things are going to go cloud native, and that's going to enable greater possibilities to push you know, content in the cloud is inherently mobile, and I have the ability to disseminate it to any device. Very well said. Very well put. Um, Frank Konechny. Frank, where's this all going down the road? We, we, we would like to see really a ubiquitous device that I could use as my desktop as well as a mobile device. That I go to my office and I put it on something and all of a sudden my desktop appears in my displays mm -hmm. and my keyboard because I do a lot of typing, right. unfortunately. And at the same time, you know, I like to take that little device with me someplace else and do exactly, you know, check in in a hotel and whatever, do my airline reservations at the same time in an ubiquitous way so that we don't say, oh, we have a laptop and we have another mobile device. We have a device that actually does everything we want to do with it and it depends on the environment in which you put the device in. Yeah. And on top of that, we'd like to go to a different authentication mechanism, multiple authentication mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know, Brian talked about, uh, you know, different things and different data. We want to be able to re-authenticate applications based upon uh, like biometrics or whatever voice mov movement, right. which is available now. And based upon that authentication, we'll determine what kind of data we're going to present to the user and do enough auto locations, geolocation, to determine where that user is. Right. And also based upon that, determine what the data we're going to present to the user. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. Uh, Jeff Hill. Where's this all going? What's the government going to look like down the road? What, what's, uh, what are all these, what's your crystal ball say? Uh, well, well, two things, and both of them have been, been touched on by the other panelists already. Okay. Um, the first is cloud, uh, cloud services. That's very exciting to us. Um, as long as the cloud services meet the security requirements that we need, and as Frank mentioned, identity, <coughs> I think Brian mentioned too, um, identity services so we can match up the users on, on the different systems. But cloud really enables mobility. It goes, it goes together with it. It makes, it makes roaming easier. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you move from one place in the country or overseas to another, you don't have to tell your like Google or Yahoo Mail that you're moving, right? It just, it's just there for you. It makes the transfer process a lot easier and, and we move around a lot. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, what you've all talked about is you know, we'd like one device or sometimes two devices, but you know, it's, it's really just the difference in, in screen size at, right. in, the, in the end. So I think mobile is moving from being an extension of the desktop IT world to the core. Right. So the desktop is really a special large screen stationary use case of a universal mobile desktop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's inevitable that we're heading that direction. I mean, I think it's uh, the industry is going that direction. Eventually, we're going to get to the ubiquitous device. I mean, I don't know what it might. They might look a little different. Some might be bigger, smaller, whatever. But I think it's inevitable that you know that's the next generation of uh, of computing. And I think industries you know moving pretty much in that direction. Um, Jack, Jake, what's it look like down the road to yeah. you? So my answer sounds just like many of the other panel members, right? So cloud, um, as, as well as virtual computing, right? So I'll, I'll, I think in the future we'll see where we, we need to scale beyond the capabilities of the actual device itself, right? Through the use of cloud. So um, all you can consume um, content for, for users using cloud-based storage, whether it's a private cloud or even commercial cloud. Uh, persistent sessions um, that can actually span 
throughout different devices, right? Mm -hmm. So um, while you're on your phone, if you want to take a look in at a productivity application and uh, work on it while on the train, so, and then pick it yeah. back and, and write and, and log back into a virtual session and, and, and basically pick up back where you left off on any other device that, that you may have too. And I uh, just want to hit on also, I think the, the mobility uh, user interface is really pushing uh, business process and innovations, right? It's like he said, it's not about apps, right? It's about transactions. So, so as, we, as, as we look at what we used to do, um, and, and, and let's just say web-based applications right. that may have 27 different functions, right? But we look at our users and they're really only using six of them, right? right. And, and, and can I put that on a, a, a mobile device? And, and we're starting to see that in the banking industry and, and, and others, so. Yeah. I know just like on a commercial phone, you got all these apps on there and you're not really sure what some of them do, but then when you go to delete them, you get a little message saying this could impact other apps on your phone. Now I don't know. Now, now you don't know. Do I delete that app, or do, it's going to cause some other problems or whatever? So it, it does make things, you know, confusing in terms of, uh, you know, how what what is it you really want on the phone, and what are the core apps that you really need to to uh, to do your job. All right, um, I'm going to make an attempt to do some summarization here. Let's see uh, where, I, where I can go with this. But uh, when we were talking progress, we were talking um, mob mobility has become a top priority. I heard someone talking here, top three priorities. One of them in, uh, is, is mobility, and I think it's pretty much obvious in every organization these days that that is true. Um, I heard some uh, a, a progress about the empowerment of the workforce, and if you think about it, it really is empowerment of the workforce. Um, you know, you're giving a lot more capabilities to those with uh, devices uh, that are off-site and so forth. And I heard any time, any place, anywhere, um, which is where we're going down the road in terms of being able to do our jobs. And and of course, I agree with that too, because I. I'm at, I don't know when, where, or I do my job. Uh, some of the specific things we talked about, um, we, we heard a lot about application development processes that are be, being put in place for mobile and how those processes are making a big difference in, in, uh, in State Department. We heard over at, uh, uh, from Frank about logistics programs at the, the Air Force and how it's making a big difference in being able to actually track devices and so forth. And, um, and Jake brought up uh, uh, the classified mobile program which I think is a major major step forward to be able to uh, you know be able to do secure mo mobile conversations and, and data it's a major uh, step forward uh, we heard a little bit about the distant mobility store and in uh, and, and, uh, uh, the discussion about the probation officers and the mobi how mo mobility programs are supporting them Lessons learned, I heard, involve the user, involve the user, involve the user, the user experience. Uh, it's, uh, you're going to be judged based upon the user experience, not how cool the technology is. Uh, governance processes need to be in place. Uh, it centralized back infrastructure makes sense so that you can uh, try to manage this stuff. Um, I heard about 24-7 support expectations from the future. People are going to want support wherever they are any time of the day. Uh, we heard about uh, mobilizing transactions and uh, for focusing on the transaction. Keep it simple came up a number of times, and, uh, and the digital divide is a reality. We just have to work around it and manage it and, and manage to it. Uh, when we talked about challenges, we talked about uh, DISA and the multiple infrastructures DISA has to support. It's not just one, but multiple being a service provider. You've got, uh, you can't think of this as a, a individual infrastructure. And uh, service ordering processes need to be developed and they're a, a challenge. Um, we heard about the fact that there's going to be people with uh, different multiple expectations of the types of devices they're going to use. You're going to have your Android users, you're going to have your, uh, your Apple users, you're going to have your BlackBerry folks, and uh, you know there's going to be camps in pretty much every organization that uh, have uh, likes and dislikes in those areas. Security is always an issue that came up, and the mindset shift I thought was a very good comment that was made. Uh, you know, you need to change your your mindset. Uh, when we talk vision, we talked um, mobility basically becoming a standard operating procedure. I mean, it's not going to be seen as something different in the future. It's just going to be the way it is. 
um, and uh, adaptive technologies that can be moved and changed and uh, in on the go, on the fly. Cloud services came up a lot and when talking about the future. Um, clouds here, we talked about security, we didn't mention FedRAMP and things like that, but there's some things out there trying to address those security issues. Obviously, secure, uh, cloud creates uh, some interesting new uh, <coughs> Challenges for industry and government in getting service agreements correct because there's going to be shared uh, expectations as to who's responsible for a variety of security related kinds of things. But it's obviously coming, it's obviously the next generation, it's obviously anywhere, anytime is going to rely on cloud. Um, better identity solutions, we talked about derived credentials and improving that identity. Uh, process and then finally uh, virtual computing came up um, as a major issue with that I got to do some thank yous here first of all I want to thank all of our uh, panelists here from taking time from your busy schedules I know you all have very very uh, important jobs and busy set schedules so thanks for coming down here and sharing information with us thanks to our sponsors for sponsoring the show without which we don't have a show uh, thanks to Federal News Radio and the good job they do here and all the good people here that make this a pleasant thing to do. And finally, thank you to the listening audience out there that tunes in and listens to the show. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.